Hello friends, Jim here. Welcome to Science Talk. Interesting article that was uh, published on the online publication EOS. Climate tipping points could be triggered by committed warming. I'll explain what, what's meant by committed warming uh, later on in the video. Unless we rapidly reach net zero emissions, the climate will inch closer to a point of no return, even after greenhouse gas emissions are reduced. Okay. So, here's a photo of some ice. Climate tipping points, such as the melting of ice sheets, could be triggered by committed warming, even after greenhouse gas emissions stop rising. As the planet warms, climate tipping points such as the melting of ice sheets or loss of the Amazon rainforest become increasingly likely. A net zero approach proposes reducing greenhouse gas emissions where possible and removing or offsetting those that are released. But such a large scale greenhouse gas removal may be infeasible for a mix of technical, political, economic, environmental, social reasons. Alternatively, a combination of lowered emissions and natural carbon sinks may allow atmospheric greenhouse gas levels to remain constant. Well, constant to what, what current levels are? Still going to lead to a warming planet. A new study by Abrams et al. examines committed global warming or warming that continues after greenhouse gas emissions are held constant until a new thermal balance is, is achieved. So that's what's meant by committed global warming. That it's what's already in the in the books. It's it's a thing of the analogy that uh, you know you have a musician leaving a band and uh, well. You know, he has a concert commitments to uh, fulfill, and he can't leave until, uh, or she, until those you know concerts are, you know, are done, and, and you know so that's you know it's committed. It's it's already in uh, uh, on the books. It it's already will happen. Will take place. The planet will continue to warm even if we go to net zero. And yeah, well, actually I actually like their analogy here. You know, you you have a faucet. You've been running, uh, you know, hot water, and then you switch to the cold side, and the water is still hot. That comes out because there's still hot water in the pipe until the cold water replaces it. So the authors, Abrams et al., present. It's a very complicated paper. Uh, but they present uh, three scenarios for how global mean temperature could rise and trigger tipping point events. One represents an increased use of fossil fuels. Another represents rapidly reaching net zero emissions. And the third, well, matches what's going on now. And it's doing business as usual. Well, we all know how the Paris Agreement set the you know, global limit, uh, limit to 1.5 C. Uh, we're already above that. So that didn't that didn't happen. That didn't work. And they they going to say a couple other things which reflect more of IPCC estimations, which we know are underestimations. So they say that oh, if we can get atmospheric radiator forcing kept constant at present levels, there's an eighty three percent chance of exceeding one point five. 55% chance of exceeding 2.0. Well, that's not very promising um, on that alone. In the scenario that best matches the current trajectory, the findings also estimate that six tipping points will be crossed by 2100. If not sooner, without a net zero plan in place, the results demonstrate that temperatures may climb by about 2.7 C by 2100. Well, this is definitely telling me that they're looking at the IPCC uh, stuff because 
it's going to be much higher than that. The author suggests a swift adoption of net zero policies and emission cuts to avoid these catastrophic scenarios. Okay, well, first of all, I have a bunch of things to say, as you can imagine. What's the one big thing they're forgetting? Oh, that's right. Look at this fo photo. Where is the ice? The ice is floating on the ocean. Right? The thing called ocean heat content, which is whoppingly high. That heat's going to diffuse to the atmosphere. Thermodynamics informs us that you now in an attempt to reach equilibrium, the heat will diffuse for a long time. That heat will increase the temperature. And, you know, with the very warm oceans now, gas solubility decreases. We are seeing outgassing of CO2. And sometimes, uh, as the methane uh, thaws, especially the uh, thermogenic sources of methane, and lots of times you get these huge releases of, of methane bubbles that rise quickly through the water column, they don't even get a chance to be absorbed or chemically react, what have you, and they just hit the surface and they burst and boom! You know, and now we have, uh, we've just added some methane to the atmosphere. We all know that CO2 and methane are greenhouse gases that will contribute to the heat trapping potential, increasing the temperature of the planet further. So they neglect to mention that. You know, uh, in some of the numbers that they're putting out here are lowball. They kind of reflect IPCC uh, ways of, a, of, of approach. You know, linear, when, when we know it's exponential. So let's take a quick pop over here as to, you know, what is committed warming. And so here we have, you know, you know emissions taking place. So a climate scientist explains why global warming can continue long after emissions end. Because of humans, the concentration of planet warming CO2 in the atmosphere is now 50% higher than before the industrial era. And these gases are raising Earth's temperature. So we know that the humans, through the use of uh, burning fossil fuels, is raising the planet temperature. So can this be halted, reversed, what have you? And, uh, well, <laughs> I would say no. And that's due to committed warming, also known as pipeline warming. It refers to future increases in global temperatures that will be caused by greenhouse gases that have already been emitted. Don't forget, there tends to be a, about a 20-year lag, give or take, of when a greenhouse gas, is, you know, a molecule, is emitted into the atmosphere and until the effects of that just now emitted molecule is manifested. So in other words, the warming we are measuring now is reflective of the levels of greenhouse gases from 20 years prior. So if we want to know what will be the effects of the greenhouse gas levels that are currently being measured today, Wait 20 years. So there's this lag effect, and that lag effect will basically in will result in higher temperatures for the planet. So uh, as it says here, it refers to future increases in global temps that will be caused by greenhouse gases that have already been emitted. So if the clean energy transition happened overnight, you're still going to get some warming. Now the question is, how much of that, how much would that continued warming be? And that depends. All right. So so we know that you know 
the greenhouse gases get trapped in the atmosphere, you know, the lower atmosphere, troposphere, right? And what this has resulted in is Earth's energy budget is not in balance. Right? We have an energy imbalance for the planet. Now, usually, most people look at this as, oh, you have radiation coming in, radiation going out. So you look at the top of the atmosphere, take the difference, that's your Earth energy imbalance. And yes, radiation comes in, uh, some is reflected, some is resorbed, and then those of the energy that's absorbed, a lot of it is re-radiated out, and then you have the greenhouse gases trapping, and, you know, and so on and so forth. You put more greenhouse gases, and so on and so forth, and then you have an imbalance where the planet is warming, and we're usually measuring that. You can measure that as like watts per square meter. Well, that's, that's all fine and dandy. You know, it's important data to have. But just remember, the oceans have absorbed well over 90% of our greenhouse gas energy emissions. Over 90%. That's heating up the oceans, right? Causing stratification, all the things I've been discussing with you for the, all these years. That heat is going to diffuse going to diffuse to the atmosphere, further contributing to the energy imbalance. In other words, it is a mistake, in my view, to only look at what happens at the top of the atmosphere, to only look at energy and compare it to the levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. You have to look at the potential energy that the oceans store. You know, think back to your basics physics. You've got a, a brick on a shelf. All right? You measure what? Its potential energy. The brick falls off the shelf, and it's moving to the ground. Well, it's now, the potential energy is now kinetic energy. You have all this potential energy in the oceans. It is now, as it diffuses, it's now contributing, it's fluxing, right? And it's contributing to the, to the temperature warming and therefore increasing the energy imbalance. And, as I mentioned earlier, with warmer water, gas solubility decreases, CO2 outgases. Well, there's more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, adding to more warming. So, if you want to look at the Earth's energy imbalance, you have to look at the oceans. And this is something many atmospheric scientists do not do. So they are not get, they're not really getting the complete picture. They're not getting all the data. Only getting part of it. And I think that's um, where they're, you know, kind of going astray a bit. You want to get a real handle on the energy imbalance, you got to factor in the ocean. And that is really not being done to any great effect. You know, and say, so, you know, the effects of you know, messing with the Earth's energy uh, imbalance, imbalance. Uh, takes time to manifest itself, like right? the lag of, that I was just mentioning. It's sort of like, uh, you know, when you turn a hot water faucet, you know, cold winter day, say, you've got cold water in the pipes, well, you got to force that cold water out, it takes time for the warm water to get to you. So that's why they use the term pipeline warming. The warming hasn't been felt yet, but it's in the pipeline. So, what are the three major reasons Earth climate is expected to continue warming after emissions stop? Okay, CO2 and methane stay in the atmosphere for a long time. 10 years for methane, 400 years for CO2. And don't forget, methane oxidizes into CO2. With some molecules sticking around for a millennia. 
So turning off emissions does not translate into instant reductions in the amount of these heat trapping gases. And we have a nice little chart here measured in watts per square meter, right? And this is relative forcing is the heating effect caused by greenhouse gases in the atmosphere measured in watts per square meter. It represents the energy imbalance. Now this starts uh, in about uh, you know 1979, and this this graph takes up to 2019, and they have CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, uh, CFC12, CFC11, and a whole bunch of other gases, which is this little orange thing up here. And you can see, you know, the CO2 is increasing, the methane is increasing. They're all increasing, all adding, contributing to the energy imbalance, which is, according to this here, is basically uh, three watts per square meter, according to this figure here. And the source is NOAA EPA. That's the source. Okay. Second, part of this warming has been offset by man-made emissions of another form of pollution, sulfate aerosols. That's the uh, aerosol masking effect, which you know, leads to a concept called global dimming, which can help cool things, or at least keep the increase in temperature lower than would normally have been anticipated or modeled. But... These man-made aerosols can harm human health and the biosphere. Removing those and other short-lived greenhouse gases translates to a few tenths of a degree of additional warming over approximately a decade. And finally, Earth's climate takes time to adjust to any change in energy balance. About two-thirds Earth's surface made up of water, sometimes very deep water, which is slow to take up the excess carbon and heat, so far, over 91% of the heat added by human activities and about a quarter of the excess carbon has gone into the oceans. This extra heat contributes to sea level rise through thermal expansion, marine heat waves, while the extra carbon makes the ocean more corrosive. It, it decreases the pH, makes it more acidic, right? So it makes it more corrosive to many shelled organisms, causing mortality, causing disruptions to the ocean food chain. So ocean temperatures warm more slowly. Right. Remember, specific heat of ocean, of water, right? Much higher than than the uh, than air. So the orange is land, and the blue is ocean. I'm not sure what's going on there. But the ocean it's really not too far, not too much less than the land. And when you think about how much energy it takes to heat up water because of the high specific heat, this is what I talk about that think of the ocean as a big like battery or ca capacitor just waiting to discharge all that energy, all that thermal energy into the atmosphere. Because as the oceans stratify, they're not going to really be sequestered to death. Earth's surface temperature, driven by the imbalance of radiant energy at the top of the atmosphere, and modulated by the enormous thermal inertia of its oceans. This goes to the point I was trying to make earlier, that if you really want to get a better handle, a better measure of the Earth's energy imbalance, you must look at the thermal inertia of the ocean. You must look at the heat content the oceans contain. It is a mistake not to. And that's uh, one of my biggest uh, bones of contention I have with atmospheric scientists, that they're not really looking at the ocean. So how much uh, warming? Well, we really don't know. The world has already warmed more than 1.1 degrees C. That's as if you lift to the, uh, listen to the IPCC. It's actually higher. It's basically over 1.5. 
How to determine the amount of warming? That's complicated. Okay. You can, uh, a study of 18 Earth system models found that when the emissions were cut off, some continued warming for decades to hundreds of years, while others began cooling down. Another study published in June 2022 found a 42% chance that the world is already committed to 1.5 degrees. What's the other 58%? Is it warmer or less? The amount of warming matters because the dangerous consequences of global warming do not simply rise in proportion to global temperature. They typically increase exponentially. Typically increase exponentially, particularly for food production at risk from heat, drought, storms. Further, Earth has tipping points or tipping elements and their subsequent interactions that could trigger irreversible changes to fragile parts of the Earth's system, like glaciers or ecosystems. Let's face it, the entire Earth's system, while a finely tuned mechanism is fragile. We won't know right away when a planet has gone past the tipping point because those changes are often slow to show up. Well, you may recall I did a ocean heat content update video and in it I argued that the planet overall already went past the tipping point and that was in the mid 90s and that is when the ocean started rapidly warming up. Could no longer sequester heat to depth. That's where we went past it. And you throw in the lag effect. Well, 20 years later, it's about 2015 or so. And here we are, you know, in the, almost in the mid 2020s. And what are we seeing? Crazy cyclonic storms, you know, that quickly pick up the ocean heat from, you know, energy and just ramp up to cat five very quickly we're seeing all that moisture going into the atmosphere precipitation bombs resulting in flooding and so on and so forth this is the new normal so the other thing i want to mention is that the pik group and i did a two-part video on this they examine the interactions among the tipping elements. And what they found was that the interactions, and when they did this report, it was several years back, and they found that we've already have warmed to 1.3. So that was several years back. We have since exceeded 1.5. They go on to project that we're on pace to basically a 7 to 11 C warming by 2100. That's what they project. The best case scenario is 5 C by 2100. And that seems to be at a minimum locked in. The PIK folks argue that 7 to 11 is locked in. You know, right, the pipeline warming committed warming. That's because things are exponentiating. All the various parameters are exponentiating. And when they examined their tipping points, they looked at the, you know, the interactions that exacerbate as well as mitigate. So they looked at both of them. And then they concluded that, well, based on the data that they have, that 1.3 had already has already occurred, and I said that was about you know three four years ago something like that, and now we're probably we're we're over 1.5, and now we're there's talk of 2.0 by 2030, and away we go from there, right? So if we look at you know let's take this all the way up the land average in 20. 16 was 1.53 C, and the, you know, the oscillatory nature is you know, seasonality, and 1.5 C by 2020, you know, according to that. Now, if we look at the ocean here, 
Okay, by the time you get to 2018, you know, the ocean surface temperature is 0.68 degrees C warmer. May not sound like much, but remember specific heat of water. So you look at that, and then from that, this is sort of this is land average. So uh, these are temperatures. Uh, they are not uh, watts per square meter. I might have misspoken on that earlier. So these are temperatures that are ab above the average. And we're seeing a clear increasing trend. So um, this is what's happening. The tipping points are kicking in. Some have already kicked them. And they're basically locking in warming of a very large scale, much faster than has prior previously occurred in Earth's history. And uh, when you get the tipping elements interacting, it can augment the warming effect. An example of that would be, you know, people look at CO2. Oh, we got this much CO2 level. We get this much warming. But studies have shown if you consider CO2 and water vapor together, the warming is greater. And now we're seeing more and more, correctly so, I think, in measuring CO2 equivalents, which takes into account methane and nitrous oxide as, you know, the three major, and then, of course, water vapor, the fourth major greenhouse gas. Remember, when you burn your gasoline, what comes out your tailpipe is CO2 and water vapor, not just CO2, right? Look at the little drip drip you see on the, off the end of the tailpipe. So, working synergistically together, CO2 and water vapor lend to further warming effects. So, um, there you have it. Tipping elements are combining, and we all know all sorts of tipping elements I've discussed with you. You know, the permafrost, the, the you know, what happens to the land, atmospheric or warming and and therefore moisture that it can hold ice melt it takes a lot of energy to melt the ice but once it's melted that energy then more rapidly heats up the water right because the conversion from latent heat to sensible heat things are going to be Getting interesting, and you know when the ex, you know the models, the PIK models have shown that exponential functions fit the data best. Well, things are exponentiating, and then if you start getting rapid exponentiation, all bets are off. Now we we've thrown around you know if five C by twenty one hundred, seven to eleven C by twenty one hundred. It's all kind of moot because when you get to about 4C, that's enough to render humans extinct. Or, if nothing more, a massive reduction in human population numbers. And even people are able to survive, there will be societal collapse. An Australian think tank a couple of years back, and I did a video on it, um, opined that civilization, you know, the order of civilization, societal uh, orderliness, could collapse by 2050. This is not going to be a good century for the human species, and for that matter, the other species that are dying off due to what humans are doing. But we're currently in a major mass extinction event. 
So, stay tuned. Thank you for your time.